This is um, our lab introduction for lab eight, which will cover loop modeling. Um, this presentation actually was not written by me. This is one of uh, Brian's presentations, which was then modified by Jared. So I'm the third person looking at this, and so I'm not entirely uh, familiar with it, so, but I'll do my best. Um, loops uh, are a really key part of a modeling problem because the uh, confirmation of loops has remained challenging for homology modeling and loops can really be important for interfaces and other such interactions. Um, they have a very large conformational space, and because of this, it's hard to get accuracy uh, beyond about 12 residues currently. One of the biggest challenges is not actually the sampling problem, but the dis discrimination problem. Uh, you know, we have a, we, we're really good at you know, putting the loop in all the different possible positions it can go. The question is figuring out which one is actually the native loop structure from, you know, thousands of decoys. Uh, there are actually several uh, loop modeling techniques that are currently in Rosetta, um, and many of them are, uh, um, you know, they're all under continuous development too. Um, and we have low resolution and high resolution phases. Uh, and we usually call the low resolution phases perturbing and the high, high resolution phases refining. It tends to be a terminology that gets thrown around. Um, so the three main algorithms um, are the following. Uh, we have uh, KIC or KIC. Um, KIC to me is like magic because the math is well beyond what I can comprehend. But it essentially does these random perturbations of loop confirm confirmation and uh, it computes an analytical solution to find the closed confirmation. Uh, CCD is usually performed by doing um, a fragment insertion. Again, not really by cutting and pasting a fragment, but by copying the uh, uh, phi and psi torsion angle um, values from a fragment into the pose, into the loop, followed by an iterative closure method that we borrowed from um, robotics, CCD, uh, uh, cyclic coordinate descent. And then we usually do that in low resolution, and then we do small perturbations followed by CCD and high res. And then there's a stepwise assembly, which is the newest addition to our um, repertoire of uh, loop algorithms, and that was developed by uh, Riju. And, uh, this iteratively builds out a loop structure, enumerating every possible confirmation. At the, at the very end, you kind of use CCD to close them up. And there's a really good paper that just recently came out where he, he publishes this and describes it. And fortunately, the link is not, the reference is not there, I should put there. Um, so the cyclic coordinate descent is, as far as I'm concerned, the easiest to kind of get a hold of what's really going on. Um, it uses inverse kinematics from robotics, I think I mentioned that already. And the idea is that you minimize the uh, root mean square distance between the end residue of the loop and a fixed anchor. Um, and I don't know if it's worth talking about this real quick, but in two dimensions anyway, um, if I have a point here and a point here, and say I just have, for simplicity, something with a couple pivots, and I'm trying to, I don't think that'll even reach. Okay, we'll do three pivots. I'm trying to get this point to superimpose at this point. What I do is I start at the first pivot, and I loop around in 360 degrees to put, this position, uh, to put this position as close to here as I possibly can. And then I might be the next step, if I've just moved that position, I might look something like, you know, something like that. And so then I go to this pivot point and then I revolve around here 360 degrees to try to shorten that distance until eventually they superimpose. And you can repeat the cycle over and over again until it happens. And so, in most cases, mathematically, it will find a solution, um, and it's pretty quick. Um, the way we do this in Rosetta is you vary one dihedral angle at a time, and you work from one end, and then you work from the other, and you go back and forth. You can also put in optional move acceptance criteria, such as you can put a check in to make sure that the angle you just picked makes sense from the Ramachandran, um, and, or you could set uh, maximum dihedral changes for the side chains. So, um, and then in the end, you, at the day, you can say, you have a filter to say if, with it, whether you actually have the loop closed or not based on some tolerance for the RMSD. So that's, that's a quick uh, overview of how that works. Um, okay, so loops is sort of set up, the structure of all the classes is set up in a manner kind of like this. You have these two uh, abstract classes, loop mover and independent loop mover. And independent loop mover um, inherits from, from loop mover and then the three subclasses that are independent loop movers are these ones here, um, loop mover perturb KIC, quick CCD, and perturb CCD. And then likewise, we have uh, the refine fun uh, meth uh, classes over here, loop mover refine, kick, uh, kick, kick CCD, and back rub. Um, 
So you know, we have different flavors we can use depending on what you want to do. So uh, what Jared was describing is the main workhorse for loop modeling is our loop relax mover. And it stores um, private data for an independent loop mover, which does the per perturbing, and a loop mover, which does the refining. So low resolution, high resolution. OK. So each of the um, loop movers implements a complete loop modeling routine in either centroid or full atom mode. Um, and because we're all trying to do the same, solve the same problem, many of the routines are very similar in the way they're coded. Um, so generally, a loop mover is going to set up your fold tree. Uh, it's really important to do. We've talked about that today. You, you have to have you know, a cut point, and you've got to have you know, jumps connecting things correctly. Um, you need to initialize whatever bookkeeping objects you're dealing with. And then you generally have um, a nested loop, where you have an outer loop where you adjust some parameter, such as a chain break weight. How important is it at this moment that the, the, the loop is actually closed? Or like a temperature, um, such things like that. And then an inner loop, which is generally responsible for doing the actual sampling. Uh, and the inner loop also has to ensure the backbone is continuous. Uh, oh, right. Also, things like just packing and minimization occur in the inner loop as well. Um, and because we have this wonderful Monte Carlo object, we can keep track of all the various confirmations sampled, et cetera. OK. So Jared wanted to say a bunch of stuff here, and I think it's a great idea, about the kind of problem that has happened because we have so many different loop methods that exist in Rosetta. They're all attempting to solve the same problem. The structure of the algorithms are going to be very similar. It's like you know, convergent evolution, kind of. Um, you know, they're perturbing the backbone, close the loop, refine the loop. That's what they do. And you apply a filter at the end. So <clears throat> unfortunately, this sort of ignores an important principle that we talked about, about object-oriented programming, and that is trying to uh, encapsulate things, um, trying to make it general, um, not duplicating code. Of course, it's easy to say that now, and hindsight is 2020, but loops code is badly in need of refactoring. And um, so there is an ongoing project to try to refactor the loops code. Um, because right now, let's say there's a bug in one of the loop movers. Chances are that bug is also in one of the other loop movers, because somebody probably went and cut and pasted the code from one to the other and then modified it as they were developing the, the new mover, which means your bugs are duplicated. So if you go in and you fix one bug, you didn't fix both. You have to go find a bug in all of the different movers because they didn't, the code wasn't inherited or the subroutines weren't, you know, weren't used. So um, this, is a, you know, this is a good example of why you should never duplicate code. You should definitely set up um, inheritance and uh, create base classes and inherit from base classes because that way if there's a bug, you fix the bug once and you just fix the bug in all of the three different methods of loop closure. So anyhow. Um, that's a point, to, that's a, it's a good place to put this in. Okay, um, more about the same idea about how we should not duplicate code. All right, so in your, um, in your uh, lab, what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be using the uh, independent loop uh, movers. Um, so, <clears throat> What you would generally do is you're going to create, you're going to create a loop, loops object, which is made up of a series of loop objects. So here is a loop. We're going to call it my loop, and it is located in the protocol's loops uh, namespace. Uh, a loop is basically just a, uh, a little structure that combines um, a starting point, an endpoint, and a cut point. Um, loops is a, is a vector of loop objects. And so you would create uh, my loops like you did here, and then you would just add loop, my loop. Once you have a, um, a loops object, you can then create a full tree that takes your loops and it creates a full tree for you. It's really handy. It's called full, full tree from loops. It's located in protocols loops, loops main.hh. This takes a pose and your loops uh, a class, and then uh, you give it uh, your poses full tree and it does its magic. I honestly forget what false is. It's a Boolean for a special option of doing one thing or not doing something. And you can look in the um, look in the HH file. It'll be pretty clear what it does. I forgot to look at my, that myself. 
All right, after that, um, some other movers that we need to set up generally for doing loop modeling is we want to have a switch residue type set mover. I think Andrew covered this and when he went through the um, review of all the movers in the protocols um, library. So we call it switch. It, um, you put the, the residue types that you want right here. And so this switch residue type set mover will change the centroid from whatever we're in. Then we want to have a way to get back. So we want to, have, we want to be able to recover our side chain. So we'll use a recover side chains mover. And we'll apply that to a pose, and that's how we, get, oh, I mean, sorry, we pass it a pose, and it will look at the side chains of that pose and store them so that we can recover them later. And so, you know, we would say switch apply to go to centroid mode, and we could say recover apply to get our side chains uh, back once we've turned into uh, <coughs> um, full atom mode. So for frag sets, again, we need to um, have a frag set. We've got to go to online, or we have to go through this crazy process of getting it working on our own system. But you have to have um, a frag fragment set library file for doing this. Um, we use a constant length frag set called frags, and we create that. You give it a fragment length, so it's usually three or nine, and then the name of the fragment set. And so we create that object. <coughs> Once we've prepared our loops and our full tree and our um, residue type set switchers um, and our fragments, we can now pick our flavor of loop uh, modeling. So we have, again, for doing the low resolution perturbing, we need to make sure we use a, um, a centroid score function, such as uh, score4l, and we can pick from perturb CCD, quick CCD, or kick. And then during our refinement steps, we can choose one of these three flavors. And then, of course, like all movers, we just set up our mover with all the various stuff we've just created, we apply it to a pose, and it does our modeling. Um, <coughs> so another workhorse for CCD closure, which I think is the one you're going to be using in your lab, is uh, this function right here, fast CCD loop closure. It's not a mover, it's a function. It takes a lot of arguments. <laughs> um, we do have a wrapper for that, which is a mover. Um, the CCD loop closure mover, which works the typical way where you apply a pose and you set up all the functions ahead of time. And if you just, the wrapper calls a function with a bunch of default options, so you don't even have to know what all the options are to start with because it has a lot of the defaults built into its constructor. Um, and that's, that's it, actually, for, for this part. So the lab will be to go through and to take your, you'll be finishing, you'll be taking the stuff you did in lab six, where you degenerated that crazy full tree, and you're gonna be applying some um, loop modeling to that. <laughs> Everybody's like laughing and shaking their head. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs>